Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our main feed that gets right to the scientific point. If you like what you hear, you'd like to hear the full episode, you can find it in the same feed. And now, to get right to the point. You've developed a fondness for the jellies. They were seducing you on some of your recent work. They were, I wrote a really good paper on it and we got quite a lot of bits wrong. <laughs> which since corrected, but yeah. Bunch of animals I don't really understand, I must admit. So of all the learning curves, I think the gelatinous learning curve was the steepest. But good fun though. It's a tricky lot to study. They're so fragile and they don't preserve great and they don't come up great. So it's a whole underreported, undersampled element of the pelagic community. I don't know, we're just sort of data starved and every time we look there's loads of new stuff. So if we don't feel qualified, if we don't feel able to jump into the gelatinous world of pelagic jellies, we'll find someone who can. So we're going to have a chat with George Matsumoto, marine biologist and senior education and research specialist based in Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, good old Ambari, in the USA. And his research focuses on the open ocean and deep sea communities with particular focus on invertebrates and gelatinous things, their ecology, behavior and evolution. joined by George Matsumoto. Thanks for coming on to have a chat, George. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we came on to this topic because on the last episode, we were really enjoying some of the new footage that's coming out from the, the dive streams, and in particular, the recent observations from the UV Nautilus of the orange jellyfish at about 1,400 meters. And I think they, they narrowed it down to the uh, Bathychorus genus, but this one was unusual being sort of a red red brown color did you manage to catch that in the news i did and in fact i was watching that live dive when it happened which is unusual because we've been blessed lately with a number of live dives that are happening simultaneously so it's it's been challenging to watch all of them we used to sort of fight over a little bit of deep sea footage but now we can flip channels we can <laughs> we can oh what are they doing what are they doing over here uh we're sport for choice now it is crazy to see the difference because, you know, really, literally five years ago, you would be hard pressed to find some live feeds. And now it seems like right now you could have live feeds coming from two or three different remotely operated vehicles. And that the beautiful, beautiful footage, and it's really, it's doing amazing work at demystifying the deep sea because it's well illuminated and it's beautiful and it's not secrets and it's not monsters. We're all just going on this amazing dive together and seeing some incredible things. And I think it's doing so much for, for Deep Sea's image, de demystifying that and removing the sort of the, the horror, <laughs> the aliens aspects, because it's just a beautiful walk. <laughs> Absolutely, that's right, because the animals down there are not horrific and they're not scary and they're not monsters. I'm not sure if we're really demystifying things because with so many vehicles sending back so many images... We keep finding new things. <laughs> that is true. Like this orange jelly that you just mentioned. Can you tell us a, a little bit about this group of jellies? Because I, I am a fish person. You know, they've got a face. They've got a front and a back. <laughs> the whole gelatinous radial symmetry group, you know, I, I am lost. I am lost. This thing had like multiple stomach pouches. Is that a thing? Yes. So so this is a really interesting jelly. It's a hydrozoan jelly. And hydrozoa is one of the classes for in the cnidarians or the jellies. And bathychorus was first described in 2010. So it's even the genus is not really an old genus. It's a deep sea species that was described originally from the Arctic Ocean, actually by a colleague of mine, Kevin Raskoff. And he described this bathychorus as it comes from the Greek name, bathy meaning deep, and chorus helmet. So it's the deep helmet. And it refers to the shape of the bell, which reminded him of Darth Vader. Yes. Oh, that's a great reference. And so <laughs> this this actually got a lot of press when it was described because, of course, he called it the Darth Vader jellyfish. We'll definitely track that down and we'll put some links. Yeah. The description, when you look at the original description, it's, a, it's an opaque white jelly with four tentacles. And in between each tentacle are three what we call stomach pouches. And so this is an interesting animal because the original species has 12 stomach pouches. And this orange one that we just saw recently is, one, it's orange. Two, it only has three tentacles instead of four. And of course, because it only has three tentacles, now it only has nine stomach pouches instead of 12. And so the question, of course, is, is this a, just a completely new species in that genus or... Did something strange happen 
shaped so that it has three tentacles instead of four. And we have to find more specimens. Oh, it could just be an unusual individual. Or it could just be a very unusual individual. Absolutely. The animal that we did see was not a full adult, although it was not a juvenile either. So they couldn't really see well-developed gonads, which sometimes you see. But even on some adult jellies, sometimes you don't see the gonads anyway if they're not reproductive. So learning about deep sea animals is difficult. And learning about deep sea jellies is even more difficult because you cannot collect them usually with nets. Or what you get, you're not particularly happy with. I've I've seen it just as wallpaper paste being poured out of a cod end. That's right. And then, you know, the the jelly taxonomists are pointed to it. It's just, have fun. There you go. One of the advantages (laughs) of studying fish is that you could actually get specimens with nets. They're not in the best shape sometimes but you get specimens and they come back so badly damaged what hope does a a transparent gelatinous animal have essentially it's just been pushed to a sieve that's right so they don't look very good when they get up to the surface in a net but that's kind of the exciting part for me is that because you can't usually cannot collect them with a net the deep sea is full of interesting animals that we really haven't seen the light of day yet because you can't collect them in a net so every dive into the deep is kind of a really neat safari into the unknown in terms of gelatinous animals. Does it cause issues when it comes to to species descriptions? There's a debate that's been raging forever and it's only getting more heated now that our visuals are getting so much better in providing a holotype. Well, that's a really good question. So I think that when you describe a specimen, you not only have to have the morphology, right, what it looks like, but these days you also need some DNA you need to be able to sequence part of the genome, if not the whole genome, so you could put it into its proper taxonomic place molecularly. And then I think it's also important to have a holotype and some paratypes, some specimens, so that scientists of the future will have something to look at and compare it to. And that's, that is a current issue right now, because when we describe new species, sometimes there's holotypes or paratypes in the museums, and more often there are not. They're, they're just illustrations and sketches and descriptions, and you're sort of left wondering, you know, has this been described before, or is this something new? Yeah. And we've got no way of knowing, like just in the last five years, the amount that, say, genetics has come on. We've got no way of knowing what will be possible with the material we're archiving now in museum collections and and with holotypes. I recently started working in a museum, and every time I put, say, a tissue sample away, I'm thinking, I might be long dead. It might be hundreds of years. Somebody might do something really cool with this. And I'm almost, I feel like I'm passing it to them through time. I feel like I'm sort of like, here you go, I got you. <laughs> there you go. I think that's a great way to look at it. And that's, and that's absolutely right. So we may not be able to do any of our own work with these specimens, but somebody down the line will. I, I really do believe that. So I think it's important to have a holotype and a, some paratypes. And, and I think having both is important. For instance, I've gone to the Smithsonian to look at holotypes, and I found out that somebody was there before me and cut the animals up to look at their gut contents. And now the holotype isn't really a holotype anymore because it doesn't look the same. Yeah, it's it's so tricky to sort of, because quite often there's destructive techniques and they, they sort of pull these needs in different directions. Right. So there's a reason to have multiple samples in a museum so that people could look at them and hopefully leave at least one of them intact so that somebody else can look at it in the future. But having the DNA and having a molecular sequence, I think, is is really important. I think it is good if we do the sequences ourselves because storing a tissue specimen in a freezer can be difficult because that means that you have to hope that One, the power never goes out wherever you've got it stored. Mm. And two, the specimen doesn't get lost somehow. And for some of these jellies, you you may be talking about a tentacle, and that's easy to lose. Yeah, the vial gets damaged or the the label rubs off. Right. Or or just funding becomes inconsistent. You can only lose it once, if that makes sense. It's It's got to persist for hundreds of years, whereas if it's data, we can back it up. Yeah, I think a great study would be to go back to some of the original jellies were described, the type location and look for some specimens because we don't have specimens or DNA from these original descriptions. But if we could find some jellies in the same areas, we could sort of tell ourselves that this is probably the animal that was described in that type specimen. 
And then we could say, here's the paratype, or here's the holotype, or, you know, here's the DNA from this species that was described 100 years ago. We're so overwhelmed with so much new material. Like, we find so much new stuff on every single expedition that uh, there's just a lot to do. So it's, it's tricky to go back and do the due diligence on those. And we need more students who are trained in this and are willing to do this type of work. I think, I think you've hit upon a great issue with our field. Because even at Ambari, for instance, we may have described over 200 species in the short time we've been around, because we've only been around for 35 years. But we probably have another 100 species that we know are undescribed, but we haven't had time to work on them yet. Yeah. And a great example of that is that there's actually an undescribed species on display as part of the Into the Deep exhibition at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Oh, we covered that one. That was amazing. And that's the graphic on the tank, right? Here's an undescribed species. It's a bit of a soundbite that I, I, I've told students a few times. It's actually the best place to find a new species is in a museum collection. Yes. Because there's such a bottleneck. It takes it takes maybe one, one expedition to, to capture something, but it could take two years to get it properly described. Oh, two years, I think, is... <laughs> Being really fast. <laughs> I'm, th- I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that because I am slow. I'm the, I, I like to think I'm thorough, but I'm not quick. <laughs> thorough. Thorough is a good word. And it's it's gotten harder. You know, when I first started in this field, I, I did have some early species descriptions when I first started. And there was just morphological because it was before DNA because I'm old. And the morphological descriptions took maybe a year or two years. But now you have to do the sequences. And it's not enough just to sequence the species you're describing. You really should be sequencing all the other related species to make sure it's not one of those. Yeah. And that's what takes the time because now you have to go get specimens. Yeah, that's true. But as, we, as we're building up these databases, because this is a lovely collaborative thing, there's things like GenBank, and uh, we do a bit of work and then we sort of throw it out to everyone and, and hey, this might be useful for you and this might give context to what, to what you're looking at. That's right. I think that's a great part of the scientific field is that we don't sit there. Most people don't sit and hoard the data thinking, you know, one day somewhere down the line, I'm going to use this sequence. Scientists are really good about sharing that type of data because everybody realizes that you could be holding up some work somewhere if you're not sharing that sequence. Yeah, we've all got more than we we know what to do with. So yeah, (laughs) hoarding always backfires because there's always more coming in. That's right. Trying to be as collaborative as I can and generous as I can because to be honest, that then flows both ways. You you become known in the field as like, oh no, they're they're a team player. They're good. They helped me out. So now I'm going to pass the ball back. And there's not enough people working in the deep sea yet to the point where we're going to start running out of material yeah there's not enough of us to to be stingy yeah so to come back to to that new jelly just as a jumping off point really is there a reason for these multiple stomach pouches or is it about the the radial symmetry is the body just sort of these repeating units and you can make a circle from as many as you want really i think it's that latter statement i think it's just a issue of symmetry it's hard to know why they have multiple stomach pouches you know theoretically it could give them an advantage for instance if something came and and took a little nibble out of them (laughs) if they lost one or two stomach pouches they're still okay because they got a few others if you only have one stomach and you lose your stomach that could be problematic but there's also a lot of plasticity a lot of variability in some of these jellies that we still don't really understand and we're still learning about. And it's interesting to me because some things are considered diagnostic features, right? So, you know, if it has, uh, and a good example would be um, the larger jellies, which have things we call oral arms, the big arms in the middle of the jelly that work as not only prey catching devices, but are also essentially stomachs. Right. They're mouth arms, we call them, because they not only catch food, they also digest food. And for a lot of animals, a lot of these jellies, the number of arms is considered diagnostic. Do they have four arms or five arms? But there's a fairly significant jelly that I was a part of a team that described it that is nicknamed Big Red, Tiburonia Gran Rojo, <laughs> right? A really big red jelly. No tentacles, mouth arms, and it could have anywhere from three to seven mouth arms. Are they the really huge ones? It looks it looks like a duvet. They're the really big ones, yeah. The ones that get up to a meter in diameter and just look really solid. We talked about that one, and I said it looked really comfy. Yeah, <laughs> it, looked, exactly. it looked like you could sort of wrap yourself up in those arms. <laughs> That's one you could probably pick up in a net, <laughs> right? And people have probably picked it up in a net and just said, what is all this red stuff? 
But it, it's interesting to me that it has a very number of oral arms. And so every time I see one, I'm sitting there counting arms just because I'm curious. And it's interesting to me, and I don't know why they have a different number of arms. I don't know what the advantage is or you know, what, what it is about their genome that says, I'm going to have three arms and I'm going to have six arms. Because when you have seven or five, or, I mean, it's, it's, it's not necessarily symmetrical anymore. Whereas four, you say, okay, that's a nice number. You got four arms, you got four gonads, you could cut the animal into four quarters. That makes sense. Nice repeating units. Yeah, nice repeating units. But sometimes you have three or four or five or six or seven, and now it's not multiples anymore. And you're desperately trying to use these characters to to sort them out. (laughs) They keep throwing up aberrant forms. That's right. Luckily, it's so far, it's the only, you know, meter wide huge red jelly yeah. that's really thick that lives in the ocean that we've found <laughs> but yeah but we would be unusual for that to that to develop in a vacuum so there probably will be others and it's only it's only now where we can we can rely on its huge redness there's every chance there'll be another and another after that that's right i mean who knows maybe the three tentacles is one species four tentacles is another five is another i don't think that's true but we don't really know because they're too big to collect. So we've never collected an adult. <laughs> the biggest one we've collected is about the size of a softball. Oh, really? It gets yeah. so big, that's a problem in itself. Yeah, so that's our holotype. We did we did finally get a holotype. And that's that's the one that's in the museum up at the California Academy of Sciences. Wow. Can I ask a bit about preservation? Because I've certainly seen samples of, of jellies be put into preservative and then just immediately disappear. What are they preserved in? Yes, and tinophores or the comb jellies are prime examples of that. They do not preserve well, except for the benthic ones. The benthic ones preserve very well, but the ones that live in the water column just dissolve. Uh, The best luck I've had with preserving them is in cooled glutaraldehyde. Right. Almost matching that viscosity because it's kind of it's slightly viscous, isn't it? I'm trying to match. Yeah. Trying to get that same sort of viscosity and, and temperature. And the problem with that, of course, is, is you really need to keep it cold. So now now you have an archival problem if you give it to a museum and the museum doesn't really want glutaraldehyde on their shelves anyway. So eventually they want it placed into ethanol. And when you do the transfer, it doesn't really work well. Even as gently as you can with all the stepping. Even as gently as you can. So so tinophores are one of those things where finding a holotype and paratypes is very difficult. And then you start thinking, well, I should provide as many photographs as I can, provide videos, because that's what's going to survive. Yeah. And then and then, you know, you've uh, you've talked to Dougal Lindsay before, I think. And of course, Dougal a few years ago described a new species of tinophore based solely on video. So never had a sample. There's a few knocking around. There's a few things that we know uh, are absolutely new and we could even pick out the characters. But yeah, that's quite a it's quite a controversial thing to do. But we yes, <laughs> we need these names. We need to be able to talk about these animals and to have that mean something to other scientists. So we're not all just spur A, spur B, but they don't line up. Uh, and there's been a few big movements for like a, an intermediate phase of visual taxonomy, visual labeling. And I think that's a great analysis of the situation is that we're, we're really good at collecting video now. We're not as good about collecting specimens. And so if we need to start talking about what lives in the ocean, we do need to start thinking about different ways of describing some of the organisms that we're seeing. Which actually leads on quite nicely to something else we were, we were chatting about. A few months back, we were all stumped by the uh, bluey, purpley, spiky blob that was uh, filmed in, I think it was in the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, I forget exactly where it was filmed, but it, it was, they saw it uh, earlier this year in June. It was first spotted, I think, I forgot how many years ago it was, 2016 maybe? Oh, it's back. We've had a, we've had a repeat occurrence. Yeah, it was back a bit. Uh, we didn't dream it. <laughs> no, you didn't dream it, right? It was just a big, <laughs> like, purple disco ball, the purple orb they called it. Very unusual. And again, it was the Nautilus that found that purple orb, which is kind of interesting. They're, they're going to new places and they're finding interesting things. And that was found, uh, that purple orb was found off California in 2016, just off the Channel Islands, off of Santa Barbara. And fortunately, that was an animal that the Nautilus was able to collect. 
And when they collected it, they found a foot, a muscular foot and rhinophores and were able to identify it as a nudibranch, a sea slug. I would not have guessed nudibranch. Which is just (laughs) amazing, right? I mean, they have some amazing forms. Yeah. But no way. That looked sessile. But then there was there was other shots, like a, there was a big globular one where it looked like a ball. And I sort of had a load of opinions about that. And then there was another picture where it flattened out and yes. all of my theories had gone. Oh, it gave us a good run. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. And we see things like that, you know, here at Ambari. We've, I remember the first time, and actually, interesting enough, that also has turned out to be a snail. We found an animal that is now called the mystery mollusk swimming in the water column. <laughs> Beautiful animal. It's it's featured now on some of the NOAA literature. But when we first saw it, I remember sitting in the control room and for about 45 minutes, we were all arguing, trying to figure out what phylum it was in. <laughs> You're right at the base of the tree. <laughs> yeah. Is it a tunicate? Is it a jelly? Is it a sea cucumber? Because we couldn't tell. It was swimming like a jelly, but it looked like it had organs. So maybe, you know, and had extensions like a sea cucumber. And, and so we just kept going on and on and on. And even upon collection, we couldn't really tell. We could rule out cnidarian. We could rule out jelly because it clearly had organs. But after that, we were sort of stuck. And it did take sequencing to identify it as a snail. And, and so that was over 20 years ago. And just to show you how difficult it is, that has not been published yet. Wow. And we're hoping it's going to come out in the next year. I will certainly follow up if that, yeah. uh, if that does come out. But it's, it's such a new frontier still. There's still so many exciting things going on that we can have the footage, we can have the specimen and still not be sure. And then, like you say, sometimes the work takes so long because it is so fundamentally different that it's going to wobble the whole tree. Yes. You know, it's not enough to just give a species description. You now have to make room for it in the trees that already exist. And that's often the, the, the hardest bit of work because you are now, you're now nudging a lot of other people's work. <laughs> There's a lot of sort of gatekeepers yeah. uh, to, to maintain that tree. And that's part of the problem. We're, we've run into a little issue with some of the reviewers and <laughs> who are not quite <laughs> as convinced as we are where it belongs. And, and there are almost two separate problems. Do you, do, you, do you get a species out there so that we, we have this unit and we can talk about it and look for them and then almost leave the where it sits in the tree for, for a much big, bigger debate? Because they, they feel like two, two quite separate but very linked parts of the process, but it's, it's difficult. Oh, you're right. And, you know, even lately, the tree of life has been shaken a little bit with the comb jellies of the tenophores sort of making a move down the tree. Yes, because we're, we're sort of looking for our, our earliest animal ancestor, and it's been a, a, a fight between them and the sponges for a while. That's right. And so the latest paper seems to put the tenophores down low and the sponges a little further up. And that, of course, has raises a lot of controversy as well. Yes. I think it's quite healthy in the scientific community. We, we regularly find out that everything that we believe is wrong. So we're, we're continually open-minded. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, but we, we stay open-minded as we get older, which I think a lot of people galvanize. <laughs> I mean, that to me is the essence of science. And for me, part of the fun part about science is there are no absolutes and you do have to be, remain open to what other people are talking about. Yeah, I think we, we've just become more right. I think right is a, is a perfect state, which we'll never actually reach. But I think we just we head in a direction of becoming more and more right. I think the absolutes might exist, but us as flawed humans might not have complete <laughs> access to that. Uh, but there's a, there's a guiding star we're heading towards. I'm not sure if we'll ever, f- I, don't, I don't know if we'll ever find those absolutes. <laughs> yes, I think they're there under the hood. I, I like to think we're getting better and better. <laughs> I think so. But it's, it's a process. It's a, it's a march. It's a direction, which is often something that's thrown back at us. It's like, oh, well, you used to think this and now you think this. And it's like, isn't that a good thing? Wouldn't you worry more if we just dug our heels in and said, no, I'm not changing our mind? <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. And one of the things we like to do on the show is to, because it was born out of us basically getting frustrated about how the deep sea was presented um, and not feeling like we had a voice. Is there any real clangers? Is there any real sort of incorrect facts that just propagate? And you'd really like to go on the record and just say like, that is not true. This is the case. Boy, that's that's a good question. Um, I guess the example that pops to mind first is that for the animals that I like to study, the tenophores or the comb jellies, most of the illustrations in textbooks 
have them upside down with the mouth on the I bottom like and the tentacles up in the air. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure where that started, but of course, you know, textbooks, every revision, they tend to repeat it over and over again. So that would be fun to fix one of these days. I think that would be great. But I think I think the biggest misconception is the one that you alluded to earlier in our conversation. And that's the idea that the deep sea is full of dark, scary monsters, because I don't think it is. I think there are some beautiful, amazing animals down there. And even the ones that when people see photos of them, think that they're really scary. They're not really scary because they're not really that big. Things like the fang tooth or the viper fish, right, with their big teeth. They need big teeth because food's hard to find. And when you find food, you want to make sure you hold on to it. Absolutely. Oh, that's that's very close to our hearts. Oh, that was brilliant. Thanks so much for having a chat with us, George. Was there any final thoughts you wanted to add or, or is that all good from your end? Well, I think the only final thought I'd like to say is that if there's any students out there interested in studying the ocean, to do it. We need more people interested in the ocean. It's the largest habitat on Earth, provides, what, 98% of available living space, covers 70% of the Earth's surface, and we still don't know very much about it, and we don't understand it very well. So it would be great to get more people helping us learn about the ocean. And there's a lot of people like you and I who would be more than happy to work with these students because we know we need more people. Absolutely. Knowledge exchange. Yeah. Well, that's that's brilliant. Can you, anything you'd like to plug, any good places for, for people to find out more about your work or about this the internship? Well, I would love, I guess, that. thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'd love to have people follow Ambari on social media at Ambari underscore news. That's where we'll post things about our internship program or anything else that we do. We're still doing a seminar series right now that's hybrid. So people could follow and attend some of our seminars too. Wednesdays at 11 o'clock Pacific time. So you could look on our website and see what our seminars are like if anybody wants to become part of our seminar series. And other than that, like I said, just follow us on social media because that's where we try to post everything we do. That's amazing. Thanks, George. Don't worry about rushing to write all those down. Uh, if you scroll down into the show notes, we'll try and gather that all into one place for you. Thank it's you. well worth a follow. I'm sure most of our listeners already do. Thank you so much for your time, George. It was a really enjoyable chat. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And that was a pressurized version of one of our longer episodes. If you enjoyed that and you would like to hear the full length episode, just match the episode numbers and you'll be able to find the full length version in the feed. Thanks for listening. We'll deep see you next time. And I abyss you already. You're on the ride.